It's April 15th, and do you know what this means? Not sure. Hi there. Today marks is the 110th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic. Yep. It is the 110th anniversary of the Titanic sinking since 1912, and the Titanic was a British passenger liner operated by the White Star Line on the 10th of April 1912 after it was completed on the 2nd of April 1912 which sank in the North Atlantic Ocean on the 15th of April 1912 after striking an iceberg during her maiden voyage from Southampton, UK, to New York City. Speaking of which, it takes 2 hours and 40 minutes for the Titanic to sink. Yes, yes it is. In fact, here's a timeline of the Titanic sinking it started on April 14th, 1912 in the evening. Let's go. On April 14, 1912 at 11.35 p.m., fleet sees an iceberg in the Titanic's path and rings the bell three times to indicate that something is ahead. He then calls the bridge. Murdoch orders the Titanic cut a starboard, to the left, and the engines reversed. He also closes the doors to the supposedly watertight compartments, but the Titanic was only five miles away from the iceberg. At 11.39 p.m., lookout Frederick Fleet spots a black object in their path. They realize that the haze is an iceberg and he rings the warning bell three times. Moody takes the telephone and receives the famous words, Iceberg, right ahead, and Murdoch runs from the starboard bridging to the bridge while shouting, Put a starboard. Murdoch then rings stop on the engine telegrams as quartermaster Hitchens begins to turn the wheel hand over hand, then officer Murdoch rings the bell, telling that all watertight doors needs to be closed. At 11.40 p.m., the Titanic was too close to the iceberg, and then collides with the iceberg, scraping its side under the water line for 75 meters. Fourth Officer Box Hall is abreast Captain's Quarters walking toward bridge. Quartermaster Liver steps onto bridge and sees Murdoch at the switch for the watertight doors. He also sees the peak of the iceberg past the bridge and hears Murdoch call hard to port. Box Hall steps onto bridge in time to see Murdoch still about the switch. Leading Fireman Barrett sees water pouring in two feet above the stokehold plates in boiler room 6, number 10 stokehold and jumps through the watertight door into boiler room 5 with 2nd engineer Hesketh just seconds before it closes. He then notices water coming into the empty starboard side forward bunker of boiler room 5, resulting that all engines are stopped. Coal falls all around trimmer George Cavell in the aft bunker of boiler room 4, and immediately he starts to dig himself out. Designer Thomas Andrews surveys the damage. The Titanic was built to remain afloat with only four compartments flooded. Andrews predicts that the ship has only about one to two hours before sinking. But the right prediction is that the Titanic only have 160 minutes left. The countdown for the time until it sank completely has begun. At 11.41 p.m., with 159 minutes left, Smith gives an all-stop order to the engine telegrams and comes through the wheelhouse onto the bridge and asks Murdoch what have we struck? Murdoch replies, an iceberg, sir. Smith tells him to close the watertight doors. Murdoch says, they are already closed, sir. Box Hall, Murdoch and Smith step out briefly onto the starboard bridge wing to look for the berg as the ship's head is now swinging to starboard with the tiller hard over to port. At 11.42 p.m., with 158 minutes left, Smith orders a slow ahead order via the engine telegrams and box hall drops down to inspect forward passenger spaces. Light Oler, still in his quarter, notices that the ship's engines have stopped and decides to get out of his cabin to investigate. Passenger Lawrence Beasley notices engines have stopped and decides to go up the second class staircase to the boat deck to investigate. Greaser Thomas Ranger notices changeover valves in turbine room had come up indicating the turbine engine had stopped. Seaman Scarrett sees the iceberg off the starboard quarter as ship's stern is pulling away as the ship is seen turning to starboard. Tremor Dillon down in the engine room notices that the ship's engines had stopped and then soon started to reverse. Hammond hears a hissing sound as air escapes from forward peak tank. On the Californian, 
Third Officer Groves drops down to talk to Captain Lord about an approaching passenger steamer coming up on us from abaft their starboard beam. At 11.43 p.m., with 157 minutes left, after seeing Smith put the engine telegraphs to stop and then what appeared to be half speed ahead, Quartermaster Liver was told to go down and find the carpenter and tell him to go and take the draft of the water. Dylan sees the ship's engines start to go ahead slowly. Passenger Henry Stengel notices that the ship's engines appear to be moving again, but was not sure why. He converses with the third officer Pittman shortly before returning to his cabin. At 11.45 p.m., with 155 minutes left, Fireman Shires, having seen the iceberg off the starboard quarter disappearing into the night, now notices the ship was still moving but not by much. Sees ice on the well deck. Lightoller sees Murdoch looking out on Port Ridgewing, and also notices that the ship was moving only four to six knots through the water. He then decides to cross to the other side where he sees Smith looking out on the starboard bridge wing. Hemming discovers peak tank flooding fast from air hissing out of vent pipe, but soon finds out that the full repeak above tank was dry. Bosun's mate Haynes asks, just as I got there the chief officer, Mr. Wild, had gotten there, and the lamp trimmer was there, Mr. Hemming. We said the full repeak tank was filling, the air was coming out and the water was coming in. Many of the crew see ice on the forward well deck after coming up from below including leading fireman Hendrickson who, like Shires, said he got a glimpse of the iceberg. Lightoller meets Pittman while returning to his cabin. At 11.46 p.m., with 154 minutes left, engines put on stop for the last time after ship moved further away from the iceberg which had disappeared off the starboard quarter. Ismay finds Smith on bridge asks him what happened, and is told that the ship struck ice and may be damaged seriously. Steam begins to build up once the engines a stopped and the safety mechanisms engage, bending the build up steam up and up and out through the funnels. It begins raising like a bubble as air escapes due to the incoming water down below. He is informed that the cushion may cause some serious damage as a result of the engines being stopped. At 11.47 p.m., with 153 minutes left, Virginian standing by as K-Prace working continuously with Titanic. Last signal exchanged between Carpathia and Titanic prior to distress message going out. Phillips did not know what happened to Titanic at this point in time other than some mishap took place. Bride was to tell Senator Smith that he thought she had got damaged in some way and that he expected that we should have to go back to Harland and Wolfs. Hendrickson decides the collision was nothing serious and goes back down to his quarters to turn in again. Second engineer Hescott tells everyone to return to their stations, and Barrett and Shepard climb up the escape to go back to boiler room 6. At 11.50 p.m., with 150 minutes left, the water is already at 14 feet above the keel in the first five compartments. Abel Seaman Bewley hears water entering hold and sees tarp ballooning over hatch. Bosun's mate Haynes sees tarp ballooning over hatch and hold, and goes to inform Chief Officer Wild. Leading Fireman Hendrickson told about water coming in at bottom of Fireman's Tunnel after returning to his quarters on G-Deck, sees water coming in from starboard side looking down from G-Deck and decides to go to the engine room to tell the engineers. Barrett sees water about 8 feet over the stone cold plates in boiler room 6, and returns to boiler room 5 with Shepard. Pondester returns to the mess room where the carpenter tells him that there is 7 feet of water in hold. Hickens notices an initial 5 star list to starboard. Boxwall returns from his inspection forward, reports no damage seen, ordered to find the carpenter to sound the ship forward, and meets the carpenter coming up the ladder from a deck on his way down. After carpenter reported to Smith that holds one, two and three, were flooding, Smith decides to go below to find Chief Engineer Bell and or meet up with Thomas Andrews. Andrews is seen coming through first class saloon. Then down pantry stairs to E-deck, and turn aft towards engine room by saloon watchman James Johnston. However, water begins entering the overlock deck below the mailroom on G-deck, then, they haul the bags up the stairs and is about to flood the mailroom. 
at 11.51 p.m. With 149 minutes left, Smith orders Boxhall to find the carpenter and have sound the ship. Boxhall leaves immediately and runs into Carpenter Hutchinson coming up the crew stars from a deck and has him report to the bridge after he tells Boxhall of water in the holds below, but he sets off immediately for the mailroom and lower holds. However, Quartermaster Liver returns to confirm that he had delivered the captain's orders to the carpenter, but Boxhall runs into a mail clerk below decks who tells him the holds are taking on the water below the mail room, then he sends him to the bridge and sets off to the mail room. At 11.52 p.m., with 148 minutes left, the lights go out in the boiler rooms and fireman Barrett is ordered to get lamps. However Boxhall reaches the mailroom on G-deck and find the hold below flooded, but the water is two feet within the top of the staircase, threatening to flood the G-deck. Pauv, after having received a word from Carpenter Hutchinson and mail clerk John Smith, water was coming at an alarming rate, so Smith sets off on a tour of the midships, using crew stairwells as to not cause a panic. He then headed down to E-deck while touring for the damage, possibly also headed to personally speak to Chief Engineer Joseph Bell. At 11.53 p.m., with 147 minutes left, Bosun Haynes arrives on the bridge and reports to Chief Officer Wild that he observed cargo hold number one flooding, then he told him to get his men up. At 11.55 p.m., with 145 minutes left, Fireman George Beecham continues to dampen the boiler in room number 6 when he hears someone yells, that will do. He and the others abandon the flooding boiler room and make their way up to the vault deck via Scotland Road. Boz and Haynes arrives in the forecastle head crew quarters saying, all hands stand by, as you may be wanted at any moment. A crewman nearby looks down hatch number 1 and sees water sloshing around the G-deck floor. Fireman Threlfall woke up by someone shouting. He noted that water flowing down the stairs into the snow cold tunnel below. Equals. Steward Jostone observes Thomas Andrews returning from the engine room and headed to the mailroom. He follows Andrews to see the first class baggage home on G deck is now flooding. At 11.56 p.m., with 144 minutes left, Johnston returns up the stars and finds Stuart Wheat and informs him of the water and leaves to dress properly while Wheat travels down the stairs and watches the mailroom flood. Quartermaster Liver was on e deck en route to the engine room and runs into stokers coming up into Scotland Road and enters the engine room and delivers the captain's note to Bell, who reads it and goes back working. At 11.57 p.m., with 140 minutes 3 left, Smith was seen heading up the working staircase by saloon steward Mackay at 11.59 p.m., with 141 minutes left, Smith returns to the bridge after his beef inspection midships and gives an order for the crew to muster the vats and preappers them for passengers should the need arise. Bruce Ismay arrives on the bridge to hear his order. Stewart continues to try and calm passengers that has awakened by telling them not to worry, and in some instances, they would be back underway to travel soon. April 15, 1912 AD at 12 A.M., with 140 minutes left, Thomas Andrews makes his report to Captain Smith shortly. Titanic will founder. The lifeboats begin to be readied for launch. The 20 boats have space for only 1,178 of the more than 2,200 people on board. An order is later given for women and children to board first, with crewmen to row and guide the boats. To avoid their panic, they had begun to roam the upper decks. Wild orders quartermaster liver to get them as are listed for the lifeboats, an office box hull order to wake officers like Toller, Pittman, and low up. At 12.01 a.m., with 139 minutes left, the lights goes back on in the boiler rooms just as Fred Barrett arrived in number 5 with lamps. He is then tasked with going to get some firemen to help draw the fuzz in the boiler since all had departed with the previous order for them to go up on deck, and then leaves and returns with 15 men. However, Stuart Wheat thought that it was a good idea to see if the crew had closed the watertight doors by TH Turkish baths, and leaves the stairs, traveling up to E deck and to the forward grand staircase, then travel back down to the F deck. 
However, he noted that both the tight doors were open, one on port, and one on starboard, but he closed the port door and had to climb the stairs to the E-deck and close the starboard door. Lookouts Hogg and Evans relieved Fleet and Leap in the crow's nest early. At 12.02 a.m., with 138 minutes left, Lookouts Fleet and Lee arrive under the forecastle and see firemen coming up to the sea deck with their kits, saying that the water was beginning to flood their quarters on the F deck. Lee looks down the hole for cargo number one and sees water rising in the G deck hold. The bosun's order then rings out, all hands to the boat deck, and all the crew on sea deck began to make their way out. Steward Etches awakens and dresses in his quarters before setting out. While in a quarter in the boo, he encounters a third class's male passenger who comes up to him and remarks, Will you build it now? And shows Etches a chunk of ice before smashing it on the deck. After this, Etches returns to his quarters and fully dresses to prepare for any further situation. At 12.03 a.m., with 137 minutes left, Saloon steward William Ward hears the third-class passengers traveling along Scotland Road outside his door. He noted that they were walking left with life belts in hand, some even carry ice, but he thought it was odd, but still had confidence in the liner, so he lay in his bunk for a little bit longer. At 12.04 a.m., with 136 minutes left, in the officer's quarters, Officer Boxhall has relayed the information on the collision to Officer Pittman, attempted to wake Officer Lowe, but is not fully awakened, and approaches Lightoller's cab. He finds Lightoller already awake and aware of the collision. Boxhall stated, You know, we have struck an iceberg. Then he replied, I know we have struck something, but he stated that, the mail room on the G-deck is flooding, so Lightoller hurriedly dresses and joins the other officers on the boat deck, but he did not think the liner would sink, but he did realize that the damage was significant in nature. At 12.05 a.m., with 135 minutes left, the squash court begins flooding with water. Smith gives the order to prepare the lifeboats, second officer Lightoller is in command of the port side. First Officer Murdoch in charge of the starboard side, along with 5th Officer Harold Lowe and 6th Officer James Moody helping wherever they could. The order to prepare the lifeboats was overseen by Chief Officer Henry Wilde. Water reaches steerage rooms on G-Deck. At 12.06 a.m., with 134 minutes left, 3rd Officer Pittman has fully dressed and arrives on the port boat deck. Wailing left until he meets Officer Moody, who was overseeing crew uncovering and readying the boats. Pittman he inquired about this situation, and Moody informed him of the iceberg collision and that there was ice in the forward well deck. Pittman disembarks on his own tour of the boo, and to evacuate any remaining crew there. At 12.07 a.m., with 133 minutes left, Officer Lightoller emerges from his cabin on the port forward boat deck and asks Chief Officer Wild if all hands had been called, but he did. Lightoller noted that none of the canvas covers had been removed off of the Regula lifeboats yet. Some stewards preemptively begin to tell passengers in their case to dress warmly, put on their lifeboats, and to go up on deck. Steward as Annie Robinson sees Captain Smith on the deck with Chief Purser Hugh McElroy. In the saloon steward's quarters on the deck, Fred Ray was getting back to being asleep, but the steward entered the room, telling everyone to get up and send passengers on the boat deck. At 12.08 a.m., with 132 minutes left, Officer Pittman saw the ice in the forward well deck and enters the forecastle head, checking for structural damage. Fireman came up and says, water is coming to our place. Pittman looks down hatch number one and saw that water sloshing in the G-deck hold. At 12.10 a.m., with 130 minutes left, Tremor Dillon in the engine room receives an order to open all tie water doors going forward from the engine room number four. However, Pittman returns to the boat deck starboard forward and notes that the boats were beginning to be uncovered. He sets to work on boat number five. Annie Robinson saw water in six steps from coming onto E-deck by the staircase to the mailroom. Smith and Thomas Andrews have come from the stairwell and she has Andrews tell Smith, well, three have gone already, Captain. 
but he leave Andrews to his inspection and turns to head back to the bridge. At 12.11 a.m. with 129 minutes left, comma, Charles and Danny Stengel have been walking the boat deck when they decide to return inside, but Charles saw Captain Smith coming up a set of stairs with a very serious and a very grave face. However, Steward as while Jessup returns inside to see Captain Smith and the purser. They smiled, but did not say anything. She turned. Jessup ran into violinist John Hume and band leader Wallace Hartley, with other members of the band behind them. Hume remarked to Jessup, saying, just going to give them a tune to cheer things up a bit. The band continued up the stairs. At 12.12am, with 128 minutes left, Captain Smith arrives on the bridge after his tour of the bow's damaged compartments, possibly also accompanied by Bruce Ismay. Smith orders for the boats to be swung out and for passengers to be called up with their lifeboats on. At 12.15 a.m., with 125 minutes left, Captain Smith departs for the macaroni wireless room and tells the wireless operators to send a distress call CQD by saying, you had better get ready to send out a call for assistance. But don't send it until I tell you. From MGY. Titanic, and finally the new distress call SOS purser Roy, with other crew members, also began to order passengers to return inside and dress warmly, then return with their life belts. He also mentioned for them to bring all of their blankets in their cabins with them as well. McElroy travels down by the grand staircase and spoits Stuart Lee on sea deck, shouting at him, get the men up and get all life belts and all passengers. Chief Baker Charles Joffin sends 13 men to the boat deck with four loaves of bread each to provision up into the lifeboats. At 12.17am, with 123 minutes left, Carpathia receives the stress message. CQD responses also will come from the Pyr Anga, Frankfurt, Baltic, Kronia, Prince Friedrich Wilhelm, SS Mount Temple and Titanic sister ship. The Titanic band begins to play. The squash cord gets wet. At about the same time, several passengers and crew see the lights of another ship, perhaps as close as six miles away, this we now know was the Californian. The Frankfurt is among the first to respond, but the liner is some 170 nautical miles, 315 kilometers, away, to the south. Other ships also offer assistance, including the Titanic sister ship the Olympic, but are too far away. At 12.28am, with 120 minutes left, water reaches into steerage cabins on the forward deck deck. All passengers are still on the ship, some not noticing the trouble that is happening. Passengers waiting to enter lifeboats are entertained by the Titanic's musicians, who initially play in the first class lounge before eventually moving to the ship's deck in the crow's nest. Lookouts Hogg and Evans hear a commotion on the boat deck and look behind them but noting people were out and about with their lifeboats on. Thomas Andrews finishes his inspection of the flooding compartments and sets off for the bridge to alert Captain Smith that the Titanic is doomed. Seaman John Pong Dester was in the seaman's quarters on knee deck trying to find his boots. As he puts on his boots, the wooden bulkhead separating the crew from the third-class space collapses and his area is flooded at three feet of icy water. He collects himself and immediately sets off for the bridge. They attempt to phone the bridge, but nobody answers, so they abandon their post and head to the lifeboats. At 12.21 a.m., with 119 minutes left, the Titanic band begins pay-forming Queen of Sheba by Handel. At 12.22 a.m., with 118 minutes left, First class pass on Jana Warren saw Thomas Andrews rushing up the grand staircase on D-deck, but he takes three steps at a time, with a look of terror on his face. Just after this, first class passenger William Sloper saw Andrews rushing up the staircase on a deck. Sloper recalled that Andrews said nothing as he passed but, one look at his face, convinced Sloper that Andrews was very worried. At 12.23 a.m., with 117 minutes left, Quartermaster Hitchens is ordered away from his post at the ship's wheel by Officer Lytoller. 
His first new task is to take the cover and grips off of collapsible D before assisting with the preparation of the other port side boats. At 12.24am, with 160 minutes left, at boat number 5, they began loading the boat with women and children. He was saying that he was awaiting his orders, causing men to leave. The officer suspects the passenger to have been Bruce his May, and departs for the bridge to find the captain. The Titanic band now performs, The Merry Widow by Franz Lehar. He tells him that, thought that Mr. Ismay wished me to get the boat away, with women and children in it. And he responds, go ahead, carry on. Pittman returns to boat number 5, climbs aboard once it is swung out, and shouts to the passengers on deck saying, come along, ladies. Ismay helps in the loading of the boat, with Pittman noting he assisted in every way. Thomas Andrews delivers his analysis to Smith on the bridge. At 12.25 a.m., with 115 minutes left, sources will differ on how long they perform, until shortly before the ship sank completely. A. The lifeboats begin loading women and children first. April 16, 1912 at 12.26 a.m., with 114 minutes left, Smith gave the order to begin loading the lifeboats with woman and child Lauren. Seaman Poindister arrives on the boat deck to hear his order. Smith departs for the macaroni home and tells the operators to send the distress call. The Carpathia, southeast of the Titanic by about 58 miles, picks up the distress call. Distress signal sent again using the corrected position of latitude, 41 degrees 46 N and longitude, 50 degrees 14 W. At 12.27 a.m., with 113 minutes left, the message gives Titanic's position as, latitude, 41 degrees 44 N and longitude, 50 degrees 24 W. The Titanic bands now performs Frankie and Johnny. Officer Box will ask if he should a distress signal after noticing a light on the horizon, but Smith explains that he's already sent one of the wireless. He now asks Smith which position he used for the signal and Smith responded with the 8 o'clock doctor and box hall surmises that the position being sent over the wireless is false, so he sets off for the chart room to figure out their position. At 12.28 a.m., with 112 minutes left, the message gives Titanic's position as, latitude, 40 degrees 45 N and longitude, 50 degrees 24 W. At 12.29 a.m., with 111 minutes left, the message gives Titanic's position as, latitude, 40 degrees 44 N and longitude, 50 degrees 24 W. At 12.30 a.m., with 110 minutes left, assistant saloon steward makes his way to the boat deck and to be assigned lifeboat, boat number 15. Upon passing the gymnasium, he notices that several passengers were inside. Some even used the equipment. Thomas Andrews saw that Steward Etches was on the sea deck has made sure all of his passengers were left for the boat deck before operating him to open all the doors and to take all the life belts. The water reaches into the crew's cabins, on E deck in front. The flooding of E deck is a massive problem, since the water can now pass Scotland Road with no bulkhead or even a door to hold it back. Third class Stuart Hart assembles a group of 30 women and children, and personally begins to lead them to the boat deck. The Titanic band now performs, The Cascades by Joplin. At 12.31 a.m., with 109 minutes left, Officer Lowe finally awakened in his cabin due to the noise outside, and finds women waiting in the officer's quarters with life belts on, carries dresses and rushes out to the port boat deck to assist in preparing the life boats. The message gives Titanic's position as, latitude, 41 degrees 46 N and longitude, 51 degrees 46 W. After roaming all over the boat deck overseeing the lifeboat readiness, Officer Lightoller approached Smith to get permission to swing the boats out, but he answered in the affirmative, and the port side boss equals ads began to be swung out. At 12.32 a.m., with 108 minutes left, Lightoller came to Smith again after number 8 had been swung out and cupping his hands over Smith's ears to shout over the steam noise saying, hadn't we better get the women and children into the boats, 
Sir? At 12.33 a.m., with 107 minutes left, the Titanic span now performs, Alexander's Ragtime Band by Joplin. At 12.35 a.m., with 105 minutes left, Officer Box Hall completes his calculation of the ship's position this doctor he gives the position to Smith. Titanic's downward slows down as the water approaches the E-deck, the highest deck the water light bulkheads has reached. At 12.36 a.m., with 104 minutes left, Officer Box Hall arrives at the wireless room, but cannot communicate it verbally due to the deafening steam noise, instead having writing it down. The Titanic's band now performs, on the beautiful Blue Dan you by Arthur Fiedler. The new coordinates given by Box Hall as the Titanic's position as, latitude, 41 degrees 46 N and longitude, 50 degrees 46 W April 12, 1912 at 12.37 a.m., with 103 minutes left, the Titanic's position is now latitude, 41 degrees 46 N and longitude. 50 degrees 14 W Steward Etches rejoins Thomas Andrews on sea deck and they arrive at the first class entrance of the grand staircase to see Percy McElroy advising for a large group of women to return to their rooms calmly and to dress with their life belts then head for the boat deck. Andrews took the stairs down to the D deck as McElroy tells Etches to gather all the bedroom stewards and head to the boat deck. April 12, 1912 at 12.38 a.m. with 200 minutes left, Ad, Steward Etches was helping to clear ropes on deck near boat number 7 when he modices Benjamin Guggenheim and his valet in formal attire and helping to usher passengers into number 5 and number 7. When he inquired why they did not life belts, Guggenheim responded, We've dressed up in our best, and are preparing to go down like gentlemen. If anything should happen to me, tell my wife in New York that I have done my best in doing my duty. No woman was left on board this ship because Ben Guggenheim was a coward. April 12, 1912 at 12.39 a.m., with 101 minutes left, First Officer Murdoch runs out of willing passengers to board number 7. He tells the crew to row a short distance away, but to stand by the after gangways to receive more passengers. Murdoch puts lookout hog in charge of number 7 and turns crew on deck, signaling that the lowering process is about to begin. At 12.48 m, with 100 minutes left, number 7 on the starboard side is the first lifeboat lowered. It carries some 28 people even though it has room for 65. Passengers are willing to board continuously getting into boat number 5 decreasing the amount of people on deck significantly with only two women refusing to enter. Lightoller has boat number four tied to a heavy coaling wire running alongside a deck in case the ship got a list or anything. While he sends two to three stewards down to find cranks to open the windows on the promenade so passengers can board the awaiting lifeboat. At 12.41 a.m., with 99 minutes left, Ida and Isador Strauss refuse to be separated at number 8, Ida insists her maid to take her place in the boat. Lightoller's orders Bose and Alfred Nichols and six others to go below and open the port side gangway doors on D-deck. Lightoller begin filling number 6 and number 8 simultaneously after the stewards fail to immediately open the windows for number 4 on A-deck. At 12.42 a.m., with 98 minutes left, Steward Weed has left the boat deck to evacuate the crew on F-deck. When starting up the stairs to E-deck, he noticed the flow of water coming down the steps quickly and keep enough to cover the heels of his boots. Officer Low works on the falls for number 5 and as May steps forward and wave his arm saying, lower away. X4, Low scolds his May and the White Star Chairman steps back and begins helping load number 3. At 12.43 a.m., with 97 minutes left, Officer Pittman and Etches climb out of number 5 and back on deck until Murdoch turns to Etches and orders them back in. Lifeboat 5 is lowered. Low loses his temper with Ismay. Mutok moves to number 3 and takes charge of its loading. Pittman climbs number 5 aboard and number 5 is the second lifeboat to leave the Titanic. As it is being lowered. Two male passengers jump into the boat, injuring one of the female occupants. 
at 12.45am, with 95 minutes left, the Titanic fires the first of eight distress rockets. Officer Boxhall begins observing the light on the horizon. Boxhall steps over to the Morse key light and attempts to contact them. A ship has been sighted less than 10 nautical miles, 18.5 kilometers, away, but the crew is unable to contact it through telegraph or a Morse lamp. The rockets also prove unsuccessful. Smith notices and tells him to come at once because they're sinking. Greaser Scott is ordered to open all watertight doors to bring a portable suction pipe forward to room number 4. At 1246A.M, with 94 minutes left, the Titanic span now performs, glutch room can idle by Paul Link. Smith orders Trimmer Hemming to go and grab lamps for the boats. At 1247A.M, with 93 minutes left, Light Oler, Wild, Smith and Murdoch go to Mutok's cabin and retrieve revolvers from a lockbox should the need arise. They return to their lifeboat stations immediately. Boxhall grows impatient at the lack of response by the steamer on the horizon and sends up a rocket via the starboard bulwark, mere feet from number one. The rocket travels 600 to 800 feet into the night sky before exploding with the deafening boom. At 12.48 a.m., with 92 minutes left, the Titanic span now performs, Maple Leaf fragged by Joplin. At 1249A.M, with 91 minutes left, Operator Phillips has Harold Bride inform Smith of Carpathia responding to their distress call. At 1258.M, with 90 minutes left, Fred Ray and Scotland Road on E-deck saw water up to the second final casing. He climbs the grand staircase and makes his way to the boat deck. At 1252A.M, with 88 minutes left, the Titanic span now performs, Vals September by Felix Godin. At 1254A.M, with 86 minutes left, in boiler room number 5, the team assembled by fireman Barrett finishes drying the fires in the boilers. Most of the stokers then depart but Barrett and two engineers stay behind. Boats number 5 and boat number 7 begins to row away from the Titanic, cutting directly out until a distance of 100 yards. At 1255A.M, with 85 minutes left, lifeboat number 3 with 32 people aboard, is lowered. In boiler room number 5, Barrett is ordered by engineer Harvey to lift the manhole cover so they could access controls to the pumps, but it is removed and engineer Shepard fails and breaks his leg. The three men evacuate boiler room number 5 and headed to the pump room. He noticed that almost all men in the vicinity depated for the left port side boat deck, causing a large crowd to gather around the awaiting lifeboats. At 1256A.M, with 84 minutes left, in the Marconi room, junior operator Bride jokingly suggests that operator Phillips begin sending out the SOS at 1257A.M, with 83 minutes left, Officer Lightoller is trying to persuade passengers to join number 6 while Smith, Wild, and other crew members are ushering women and children into number 8. Passenger Emma Bucknell recalls while near number 8, that men growing desperate as only the women were allowed to board. Smith handed Bucknell a basket of bread after she boarded before turning to the officer in charge of the boat. The Titanic span now performs, Pleasant Moments by Scott Joplin. Smith pointed to the steamer light on the horizon, saying there is a light out there. Take the women to it and hurry back as speedily as possible. At 1A.M, with 80 minutes left, number 8 is among the first lifeboats lowered on the port side. It is launched with only two people, including first-class passenger Lucy No Martha, Countess of Roths, Isidor and Ida Strauss are offered seats in the boat. However, Isidor refuses to disobey the order of women and children first. The watertight bulkhead between boiler rooms 5 and 6 is tested by the pressure on the other side, the damage by the coal fire, and gives away. E-deck starts to flood, and Scotland Road makes the Titanic stop lurching to starboard, and immediately after, she is much more heavily lurching to port. The news that Titanic is sinking reaches gay price and the US half the world is now listening to Titanic. The grand staircase landing on E-deck starts flooding. At 1048.m, with 76 minutes left, 
Boat number three begins to row from the Titanic towards the light on the horizon. At 105A. M, with 75 minutes left, number one is launched with only 12 people. It can hold 40. However, Lightoller is short on crewmen after having sent seven men below to open the D deck gangways. Four minutes of silence is observed. It is unknown where the band will move out onto the boat deck. At 107A. M, with 73 minutes left, as number one lowers to be deck, it became snagged on a rigging wire and the crew on board cannot free it. The lowering is halt while they attempt to free themselves. At 110A. M, with 70 minutes left, number six is launched, containing passenger Mally Brown and lookout fleet. The lifeboat is commanded by quartermaster Robert Hickens, who was at the wheel when the Titanic struck the iceberg with 22 people aboard, and the Titanic span resumes, and performs, waiting for the Robert E. Lee by L. Wolf Gilbert. Passengers in the boat noticed that the initial 5 degree starboard list had lessened some, but they still had to reach out and push the lifeboat from the Titanic's hull at times. In boiler room number 5, Barrett rushes to climb the escape ladder of the pump room when a wave of seawater comes rushing between the boilers. The cold bunker door failed. Barrett saw water making its way up to Scotland Road defaring the bow upon reaching the E-deck. At 112A.M, with 68 minutes left, the Titanic span now performs, Turkey Trot from the White Star Line songbook. At 115A.M, with 65 minutes left, Water begins to creep up the lowest level of the grand staircase, E-deck. The large group of male passengers near the port aft lifeboats continues to grow, and most of the Murdoch's crew from the forward starboard lifeboats have to run left to assist in subduing the growing crowd. At 116A.M, with minutes left, at number 14, around 20 or so passengers have been loaded when the men nearby panicked. Halfway into number 6 is the scent. The bow tips dangerously down at the bow and quartermaster Hitchens calls up to Lightoller to hold in lower aft. The Titanic span now performs, the Merry Widow by Freon's Lair. A yachtsman steps forward and lowers himself into the boat via the fall lines, and number 6 continues lowering. At 117A.M, with 63 minutes left, Officer Lowe has traveled from starboard forward T port aft and runs into Officer Moody. They both agree to take charge of lowering one bow each, 14 and 16, after Lowe's insistence from seeing boats lowered without an officer in charge. Workers in boiler room number 4 noticed that water is beginning to flood not only from overhead, but from the stone cold plate. At 118A.M, with 62 minutes left, in number 1, lookout Simmons see the D-deck portholes under Titanic's nameplate on the bow submerging into the sea. The Titanic span now performs, Frankie and Johnny, again. At 119A.M, with 61 minutes left, boiler room number 4 is abandoned when the second engineer Hesketh shouts, We've done all we can me, get out now. Workers notice is that the stoke cold plate is continuing to leak and water is already a foot deep. At 120A.M, with only 60 minutes left, Lifeboat number 16 is lowered with 53 people on board, but Moody did not join number 16 and instead versaw its looking. However, no passengers are near the starboard daft lifeboats due to the growing crowd of men on the port side virtually. At 123A.M, with only 57 minutes left, the Titanic span now performs, Oh, You Beautiful Doll by Brown and Air. At 124AM, with only 56 minutes left, Officer Maddy crosses over to starboard daft and assists Murdoch in landing number 9. At 1.25A.M, with only 55 minutes left, boat number 14 is lowered, it finally gets away with 40 people aboard. Trimmer Cavell decides to re-enter boiler room north. For after seeing nobody in Scotland Road, but when he enters, he finds that the room was completely abandoned and starting to flood with water though not much, so he makes his way to the boat deck to number 13 and number 15. The first class dining saloon starts taking in water. At 1.26A.M, with only 54 minutes left, 
As number 14 lowers to the A-deck, Lo saw a large group of third passengers looking as in they were going to jump in. He draws his revolver and shoot three warning shots into the air. The Titanic span now performs, Emperor Walt Strauss. At 1.27 a.m., with only 53 minutes left, as boiler room number 5 and number 4 floods, the Titanics begin to go down by the bow more rapidly after remaining almost motionless for a full hour. At 1.30 a.m., with only 50 minutes left, amid a growing panic, several male passengers try to board number 14, but number 9 on the stern starboard side is lowered with some 40 people on board. At 1.33 a.m., with only 47 minutes left, Officer Murdoch moves to number 11, but is already loading in women and children from the A-deck promenade. He noticed a group of men looking as if they are going to jump and board number 11 and he shout out, women and children first. Bruce is made notices Edith throws a bomb on the boat deck and shouts, you. What the devil are you doing here? I thought all the women had left the ship. He then takes he by the arm and proceeds down to the A-deck where officers take he and put her into number 11. At 1.35 A.M., with only 45 minutes left, number 11 is lowered with 50 people on board, nearly full. At 1.37 A.M., with only 43 minutes left, the Titanic's position is now latitude, 40 degrees 52 and and longitude, 61 degrees 18 W. At 1.38 a.m., with only 42 minutes left, the Titanic span now performs, Maple Leaf Fragged by Joplin. At 1.39 a.m., with only 41 minutes left, the starboard list was eliminated, but crew noticed that the Titanic is beginning to list the port. The port list is noticed to e growing during the loading of the boats number 13, number 15, and number 10. At 1.40 a.m., with only 40 minutes left, 6th Officer James Moody lowers boat number 13 with 55 people aboard, with 10 seats left. The final distress rocket is fired. Thomas Andrews is seen standing in the first-class smoking room staring at a painting, Plymouth Harbor, above the fireplace, his life jacket lying on a nearby table. There were testimonies of sightings of Andrews after that moment. It appears that Andrews stayed in the smoking room for some time to gather his thoughts, then he continued assisting with the evacuation. The mystery ship, Californian, turns away or is no longer visible. At 1.41 a.m., with 39 minutes left, lifeboat number 15 is lowered, this time with 68 people aboard, the most of all lifeboats. Under the rush to escape. Boat number 3 is almost crushed when it is washed under the descending boat number 5. The Titanic span is now performing, London Rear. At 1.42 a.m., with 38 minutes left, Smith returns to the Macaroni wireless room and informs the operators, saying, she would not last very long. Engine rooms were taking water and that the dynamos might not last much longer. Phillips decides to go have a look on deck for himself and turns command of the apparatus over to operator Bride. At 1.43 a.m., with 37 minutes left, the Titanic's engine room was getting flooded. At 1.44 a.m., with 36 minutes left, Smith notices number 2 is about to lower an orders box hull to get in, and the Titanic span now performs, elite syncopations by Joplin. At 1.45 a.m., with 35 minutes left, lifeboat number 2 is lowered with 17 people aboard. At 1.46 a.m., with 34 minutes left, as number 11 reaches the water, the officers have trouble disengaging the falls so they can row away. The discharge of water directly behind them causes a slight panic in the boat. The falls are released and number 11 begins to row away quickly as most on board feared that they would be pulled under by suction when the Titanic is foundered. At 1.47 a.m., with 33 minutes left, Phillips noted a very serious list to port. When he looks over the forward bridging wall, he saw water in the well deck down below. He immediately departs to the macaroni room to tell Bride of the situation. The Titanic span now performs, 
Let Me Call You Sweetheart by Friedman and Whitson. At 1.488.m, with 32 minutes left, while boarding is underway at number 10, a woman's dress causes her to slip and fall, but someone on a deck catches her, and she is able to proceed back to the boat deck and join number 10 properly. At 1.49a.m, with 31 minutes left, Box Hall only had one crewman in boat number 2 and has to order passengers to begin rowing away. They reach a distance of only 100 feet before they stop and watch the liner sink. The Titanic's band performs, Pleasant Moments by Joplin, again. At 158.m, with 30 minutes left, number 10 is launched with 57 people on board. Among the occupants is nine-week-old Milavina Dean, who will become the last living survivor of the disaster. Smith Auger's quartermaster wrote to stop firing rockets and to look after no. Sea of the starboard side. Number 13 is pushed left by the condenser discharge, crew on board have to cut the fall lines due to number 15 being lowered directly on top of them. At 151A.M, with 29 minutes left, Smith looks over the port side and sounds a whistle and sounds via megaphone saying, bring those boats back. They are only half filled. Vauxhall in number 2 hears that order, come round to the starboard side apparently to the gangway doors, and he ordered the boat to begin rowing. In number 6, Quartermaster Hitchens hears Smith's order, but tells the occupants, no, we are not going back to the boat. It is our lives now, not theirs. Many women in the boat protest, but they continue to row away from the Titanic. At 153A.M, with 27 minutes left, number 4 reaches the water, but the falls have to be cut with a knife. A seam shout up, we need another hand down here. The Titanic span now performs, the Star Spangled Banner by Francis Scott Key, the United States National Anthem. Lightoller asks, how many seamen have you and is told there is only one seaman in the boat. Lightoller sends Quartermaster Perkis and another sailor down the falls into the boats and Perkis takes charge. Emily Ryerson in number 4 noted how shocked she was when they reached the sea. A deck was by her approximately 20 feet above the water, and that as they began to pull away water began to flow into open portholes at the waterline. At 154A.M, with 26 minutes left, Officer Lightoller is reported by some to remove a group of males from Nome. D with the revolver. The remaining crew on the boat deck lock arms and prevent men from swamping the boat to only allow women and children inside. The Titanic span now performs, the Barker roll by Offenbach. At 155A.M, with 25 minutes left, Baker Joseph returns to A deck after going to his cabin and begins to throw deck chairs and anything not tied down overboard to assist anyone in the water not in the lifeboat. In number 15, Stuart Nicholas noted that as they had pulled some distance from the Titani, the starboard propeller was perhaps halfway above the water. At 157A.M, with 23 minutes left, Smith enters the wireless cabin for the final time telling the operators, you can do no more, look out for yourselves. But as he leaves, Phillips continues to pound out wireless signals. At 158A.M, with 22 minutes left, the Titanic span now performs, Madama Butterfly by Pusini. At 2A.M, with 20 minutes left, collapsible boat C is two-thirds full when a group of passengers try to storm it, somebody, maybe Chief Purser Hugh McElroy or Chief Officer Wild, fires his pistol twice skywards to try to attain some attention. Bruce Ismay, White Star Director, climbs aboard the boat as it is lowered with 43 people aboard. Thomas Andrews is seen back on the boat deck. The crowd has begun to stir, but there are still women reluctant to leave the ship. To be heard and to draw attention to himself, Andrews waves his arms and announces to them in a loud voice. Another reported sighting was of Andrews frantically throwing deck chairs into the ocean for passengers to use as floating devices. The water reaches the A-deck promenade. The Titanic's position is now latitude, 40 degrees 32 N and longitude, 61 degrees 18 W. At 201A.M, with 19 minutes left, 
Operator Phillips attempts to contact Carpathia and tell them that they were abandoning the ship two to three times, but noted to junior operator Bride that there were no replies. The Titanic span now performs, Eternal Father, strong to save by Whiting. At 2.02 a.m., with 18 minutes left, Titanic's power begins to diminish, and rapidly begins to decline. With passengers noting that lights on a deck were burning a reddish color. At 2.03 a.m., with 17 minutes left, Officer Wild issues an order which Light Toller repeats, all passengers to the starboard side to straighten her up. In number 2, Officer Box Hall begins to have doubts about loading in more passengers at the starboard gangway without getting swamped and orders for everyone to row away from the ship. The Titanic span now performs, Alexander's Ragtime Band by Berlin. At 2.04a.m, with 16 minutes left, after finding and loading as many female passengers as they can, officers board no. Dean prepare to lower away, but quartermaster row in no. C noticed that the ship had went down significantly during their descent. At 2.05 a.m., with 15 minutes left, Captain Smith goes to the wireless cabin and releases Phillips and Bride. Phillips continues to work while Bride gathers their papers before they leave. The water reaches the rim of the bridge rail. Collapsible D, with 20 people on board is lowered. First officer Lightoller draws his revolver to keep the men from rushing the boat. Passengers Hugh Woolner and Moritz Haken Joe Ernstrom Stefansson make a jump for it, taking places 3 and 4 of the 47 available. At 2.06 a.m., with 14 minutes left, Lightoller takes a look down the crew stairwell just abaft the bridge and saw water is already on B deck and rapidly climbing the stairs to the A deck. He immediately begins to prep you know. Be on the port roof of the officer's quarters, but Officer Murdoch does the same thing with no. A on starboard. No. DF fallen became jammed as the boat reaches the A deck, causing the boat to eventually reach the water with the rear still an estimated 5 feet above the sea. The Titanic now performs, Sanj Dottomy by Joyce. At 2.07 A.M., with 13 minutes left, MGY's signal low the Titanic is very weak. At 2.08a.m, with 12 minutes left, the Titanic's power started to get weaker, and the panic started in fear, causing the panic to get louder and louder. At 2.10a.m, with only 10 minutes left, steward Edward Brown saw the captain approach with a megaphone in his hand. He heard him say well boys, do your best for the women and children, and look out for yourselves. He saw the captain walk onto the bridge alone, this was the last reliable sighting of Smith. Cecil Fitzpatrick reported seeing Captain Smith on the bridge, talking to Andrews. He also saw Andrews leave the ship, tossing the deck chairs overboard on the boat deck. The signal from the Titanic is transmitted for the last time. At 2.11a.m, with only 9 minutes left, crewmen struggle to free collapsible B and A on the roof of the officers' quarters. They eventually float off the ship, overturned, and later saves more than a dozen men from the freezing water who balance and cling to its curved hull in the ice-bound Atlantic. Captain Smith is last seen in the bridge, the water up to his waist, his hands on the wheel. Philadelphia banker Robert W. Daniel describes it, I saw Captain Smith in the bridge. My eyes seemingly clung to him. The deck from which I had leapt was immersed. The water had risen slowly and was now to the floor of the bridge. Then it was to Captain Smith's waist, I saw him no more. He died a hero. Just by then, the water comes settling over the boat deck, the bridge quickly goes under and the boats float away. At 2.12 a.m., with only 8 minutes left, the Titanic span now performs nearer God to thee by Adams, the last music performed at the Titanic. At 2.13 a.m., with only 7 minutes left, Titanic begins its rapid, final plunge into the sea. A giant wave washes across the boat deck, forcing the remaining passengers to the stern. Many people are washed off the deck and fight to get into the collapsibles, but some occupants push them back. Meanwhile, water reaches final no number 1, and its cords snap, causing it to fall on some swimmers. 
six or seven crew members begin to push the boat aft to work it around the stairwell just abaft the berge, but due to the list and a final stay wire, it would not budge. At 2.14 a.m., with only six minutes left, Collapsible's boat B is released from the roof of the officers' quarters and lands upside down on the boat deck. A large percentage of the passengers waiting know. Abandon hope of climbing abroad and begin running towards the stern. At 2.15 a.m., with five minutes left, the grand staircase is flooded to the clock and a massive wave crashes through the iron and glass dome. The boat takes a slight, but noticeable plunge downwards. Many passengers noted that as the boat plunged down, the port list seemed to correct itself until the ship felt to be on an even keel, and the decks even seemed to rise a few feet into the air. The propellers now come out of the waters with the stern rising rapidly. A wave is produced by the bow dipping down, and it washes P to the base of funnel number two and it also washes what Colonel Gracie describes as, a mass of humanity off the ship into the sea. The wave also pushes No. B and No. A free of the ship, but they still continue to linger near the Titanic. Jack air on the starboard side of the boat deck near the number two funnel jumps into the sea after his friend Milton Long. He noted that the port list had practically eliminated itself by the time he jumped, and when he surfaced, he may not see his father, nor his friend Milton again. A building noise is heard by the survivals in the lifeboats, as some describes them as explosives and a wholesale breakage of China. Others claim that it resembled thunder. However, some of them may even claim that a whirlpool forms after the forward funnel got collapsed, which sucks a large amount of the crowd previously washed off of the Titanic back into the bowels of the ship as it sinks. At 2.16 a.m., with only four minutes left, the glass and wrought iron dome for the first class grand staircase caves in, filling the ship with more water and breaking the staircase in the process. The lights in the Titanic goes out. Survivors in the lifeboats plunged into near total darkness. Some report that seeing light remain on after the breakup, but the idea is hotly debated. The second funnel got collapsed and fallen down. At 2.17 a.m., with three minutes left, the Titanic breaks apart. The water reaches funnel, and it falls shortly thereafter. All of the funnels got collapsed and fallen down. At 2.18 a.m., with only two minutes left, the stern reaches at a 23 degree angle. Just half of the ship is out of the water. An increasing roar is heard by those in the boats, as everything movable in the ship breaks loose and crashes forward against walls and bulkheads. Some even fall to the submerged part. The ship's lights until now have been kept on only by the efforts of those heroic engineers, suddenly go out, flash once more and are then extinguished for good. Shortly after that, the pressure and gravity on the stern is too much to handle. The double bottom is all what is holding Titanic together. The stern falls almost back level. At 2.19 a.m., with only one minute left, the stern rapidly floods with water now, and the submerging front section pulls her via the keel back in the air, until she almost goes straight up. As the front section is sunk, the stern floods and rises in the air quickly till she reaches 89 degrees. The bow finally gets entirely loose, and goes down to the bottom. At 2.19 and 30 seconds a.m., with 30 seconds left, Titanic's stern holds still for half a minute, right up, but then goes down. At 2.20 a.m., the ship, the Titanic, is now officially lost. People in the water slowly froze to death and others die in the icy water with a temperature of 28 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 2 degrees Celsius. Sudden immersion into freezing water typically causes death within minutes, either from cardiac arrest, uncontrollable breathing of water, or cold incapacitation, not, as commonly believed, from hypothermia, and almost all of those in the water died of cardiac arrest or other bodily reactions to freezing water, within 15 to 30 minutes. The stern section implodes and goes into a spiral dive, ripping itself apart as it falls. At 2.24 a.m., after a smooth journey of 3.9 kilometers, 2.4 miles, down, the front section hits the bottom of the ocean. 
at 227A.M, after a bumpy ride of 3.9 kilometers, 2.4 miles, down, the stern section hits the bottom of the ocean. Less than a third of those aboard Titanic survived the disaster, over 1,500 people died in the disaster, making it one of modern history's deadliest peacetime marine disasters. So that's the timeline of the Titanic sinking. So that's how the sinking began in the evening. I felt terrible who all these people who died during the Titanic sinking disaster. Yeah, 110 years ago, the Titanic sunk in the North Atlantic Ocean during the voyage to Southampton. Man, April 15th, 1912 has got to be the worst maritime disaster in the history of the world. Yeah, that was awful for the Titanic disaster to happen in April 1912. So yeah. Anyways, I hope you understand about the timeline what I said during the sinking of the Titanic that happened 110 years ago. But anyways, as I said, over 1,500 people died during the Titanic disaster in April 1912. So RIP to all these people who died during the sinking of the Titanic that happened 110 years ago.